Mr. Martin Griffiths, United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, welcome to Al Arabiya, sir. Thanks, Talal. Good to be back. Thank you. I'd like to start with Afghanistan. Afghanistan had a good day in Geneva on the 13th of September, donor conference with donations more than $1.1 billion. Yeah. Uh, can you describe the donations by my region, the Arab region, towards this? Uh, total Muslim well, brothers and sisters in Afghanistan? I can't give you a total because the pledges are not yet finalized and, and okay. done. But I can, I can, I can um, tell you about the interest from, from the region. Okay. And of course, when I went to Kabul, I went in through Qatar, for example, uh, who helped me go in and out. And of course, you know, we have known each other a lot, talking about the rest of the Gulf region. Um, so there's a, a high degree of interest from the region to assist the people of Afghanistan. This is not surprising. The generosity of your region has always been remarkable. I have seen it firsthand on Yemen in these past years. So it doesn't surprise me. But I think what everybody was asking at that conference was, if we give money, will it be pr spent properly and for the people of Afghanistan? That was the big question. Clearly, for many of them, the answer was yes. We raised over... A, 1.1 or 1.2 billion dollars. That was a phenomenal result. Now we have to deliver. The United Nations warned by the end of the year 97% of Afghans will be living below the poverty line or level. Will the UN and agencies be able to keep up with the needs of the Afghani people and for how long? Well, that figure, which I think was quoted in a UNDP report, That's correct. is a possibility. It, it, it will happen if we don't do certain things. What are those certain things? And that's where the money comes in from that pledging conference on the 13th of September. They say by the end of the year. Yeah. By, yeah. So we need to do certain things between now and then. We, we, we have a four-month four program. We need to uh, deliver humanitarian assistance for their immediate needs, the displaced, food, protection, and so forth. But we also need, and this is where it becomes more complicated, to preserve basic services to the people of Afghanistan so that, for example, the up to the half of the children under five who risk malnutrition, that we can prevent that through proper health care and proper nutrition. So we need money for those basic services as well as money for classic humanitarian projects. Several world leaders have said that they need to see positive actions by the Taliban, not words, and then they will fund the United Nations operations for Afghanistan through the UN. How do you view this? Is it workable that way? Humanitarian assistance, as you know, Talal, by its very nature and by its definition, is unconditional. Of course, and this is why I went to Kabul, I wanted to engage with the Taliban leadership about the issues which would determine the international response to Afghanistan now under their leadership. I spoke particularly about the rights of women and girls. I also spoke about the rights of independence of humanitarian agencies. And they gave me the commitments which you, of which you know and which were read out in that conference. Now, humanitarian assistance may be unconditional, but that isn't true of other forms of assistance. And it is very clear, and it was stated by, I think, all the speakers, over 80 of them in that uh, conference, said we need to see performance by the Taliban according to international norms. In fact, we want Afghanistan to return to the international community as a prosperous, stable, and flourishing country that can only be achieved through honoring the rights of its people and preserving the inclusivity of governance. That's what is needed. Humanitarian assistance comes first. It's the first uh, entry point for the international community and that's where we are responsible. But that, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there at all. And we need to see compliance and performance by the Taliban on the commitments that they gave me when I went there. From your visit earlier this month to mm -hmm. Afghanistan and meeting leaders of that movement, what assurances did you get from the leadership that the assistant humanitarian aid will be delivered unhindered uh, un un unimpeded to the, to the needy. Well, I was able to read out at that conference a letter to me from the Taliban leadership which confirmed in writing 
the oral commitments they had made to me when I was in Kabul. And I'd asked them to give me that in writing. Why? I wanted to make sure the conference knew, but perhaps more importantly, I wanted every single humanitarian agency in Afghanistan to have a copy of that letter, which gave these assurances about the independence of humanitarian agencies, their independence of operation, independence of staffing, the right of men and women to work in those agencies, all committed to by Mullah Barada and framed in this letter. In addition, I wanted the promises made about rights of women and girls also to be enshrined in that letter. And they did, but, and it's a big but, with a proviso that these will be preserved and protected within and in the light of religion and ideology of Afghanistan. Now, there's clearly a lot of work that needs to be done on that, to say the very least. But what we have been doing since receiving that letter is to turn that into practical operational instructions, working with Taliban authorities across the country to say, you can't go into the offices of an NGO. You can't stop that, those women from working. You can't stop that convoy from moving. So far, on that front, we're seeing good progress. We haven't yet seen the commensurate progress, as you well know, on the rights of women and girls to education, employment, and movement. Are you telling me now that the women working for the United Nations and humanitarian services in Afghanistan mm -hmm. are working in the field? It's not just the United Nations. I went on behalf of the humanitarian community, mm -hmm. and that includes perhaps many, many more who yes. work for international NGOs and Afghan NGOs. Okay. In fact, the majority are in Afghan NGOs. There are 156 organizations, partners, as they put it, working in Afghanistan. All those people and the women working for those organizations are protected in principle by the commitments that were given to me. No, now, but it's uh, in principle. I understand, but mm. it, uh, on the ground now, yes, yes. Are, are the women working? Uh, in some places, yes. In some places, no. And what we've seen, and I discussed this when I was in Kabul, what we've seen is a very varied experience across Afghanistan. In some places uh, where the Taliban leadership's command and control is better, Women are working. It's not the only issue, by the way, to be discussed. No, it's but it's an important issue. Well, it's an important issue. Fifty percent of the of uh, your well, working force. It's an important issue, but it's not it's not the only issue, which is why I stressed the need for independence of operation. That's an important issue too. So we're seeing a, a difference in practice. In some places, not as good as we want, and there we're intervening. In some places, slightly better. Uh, what the Taliban said to me when I went there, and I went there very early on, as you know. Uh, is that they have got to learn about gov government. They've yeah. got to learn about ruling. It's not what they have in their past. Mm -hmm. They're good at fighting, not at ruling. They have to learn to be good at it. What was your perception about Afghanistan when you visited, before you visit and after you visited? And is the Taliban government treating Afghanis in a fair way? I don't think they're treating Afghans in a fair way at all yet. And I, I went there in 1998 to negotiate with the Taliban when they were last in power in Afghanistan. And those negotiations did not produce the kind of results that we needed. So when I went this time, I was expecting a similarly difficult engagement. What I found was that it was easy to be direct, was it was easy to be insistent, and it was easy for them to say, importantly, we understand something different now from before. We understand that we need international support. We understand we need our banks to open. We understand we need support services for our people because, by the way, now they own that process mm -hmm. and we need to see how they can deliver also service their people. So for us, it's a complicated process. We engage, but on the basis of principles and Talal, and I really need to insist on this, we engage on the issue of aspirations. We do all wish, as much as anyone in any country, that the aspirations of the people of Afghanistan be met, whoever is ruling. There will not be a stable region without those aspirations being met. It won't happen tomorrow, it won't happen the next day, but it must happen in due course. I'd like to move to Yemen quickly. Time is catching up with us. There are key issues related to the crisis, including the prevention of famine, protection of civilians, access of 
challenges to humanitarian aid and assistance and support uh, for the failing economy. What are the plans to address all these issues? And I say this to your region, Tal Al. They have been generous. And the Yemen humanitarian response plan is very well funded, very well funded, but it still needs more. It still needs more. Why? For the reasons you've, you've put forward. The economy is perhaps in as serious uh, straits now as it ever has been, and famine has not gone away. Yeah. And we see, of course, that the war has not gone away, and I've been hearing just today about the Southern Transitional Council and its claim to institute a state of emergency. These are very alarming developments. Let me move to Ethiopia, sir. Yes. In northern Ethiopia, mm. now two months of uh, conflict, which has expanded, and mm. that's the worst part, beyond Tigray, and, and into Afar and, uh, and into Mahara, Amhara. Uh, and it's causing needs uh, to, to, to rise rapidly between the civilian population while humanitarian access remains complex and constrained. Yes. Uh, some relief items have been denied passage. There is lack of fuel. Uh, many checkpoints along the route uh, of delivery. Uh, what are we doing as a United Nation uh, to make sure that we use uh, our abilities and capacities to provide so significant or sufficient humanitarian aid to these people? Well, first of all, we have been for some time um, running logist a logistical operation going into Tigray in the northern Ethiopia, where the, still the great majority of those in need reside, and where, as you say, their access to supplies has been patchy at best, uh, for all sorts of reasons, the ones that you have described, but also because there is a war going on, and they need to cross the line, and that, as we know from Syria and elsewhere, is complicated. But for the humanitarian agencies, that is an urgent necessity. And I've often said that they need 100 trucks a day to maintain the well-being of the people, the 5 million people in Tigray, and that has never been managed. It has never been hit. That's bad. Uh, the worry that we have also, however, is the one that you referred to at the outset, which is that this conflict is now evolving, is now moving into other parts of Ethiopia, and is now... Uh, engulfing other populations beyond the Tigrayans and the Amharans and the people of Afar. That's a huge worry. So the other thing that humanitarian agencies are doing is planning for how to deal with these evolving and expanding needs in other parts of Ethiopia. And I'm not even talking about the threat to the fabric of the state caused by that. Simply looking at the humanitarian needs, we need to be able to look over the horizon and say, what is going to happen? in uh, October after the election? What is going to happen in November after a new government has come in? Where will the humanitarian needs be greatest and how will the logistics match those needs? I think the Ethiopian situation is perhaps the most difficult humanitarian situation in the world today and the most worrying. Mr. Martin Griffiths, United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator we thank you for your insight, as always, and uh, we wish you all the very best of luck in your very challenging uh, new position. Thank Th you, sir. Thanks a lot, Talal.